Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar from the Institute of Export and International Trade about the UK's Border Target Operating Model, or BTOM, as it's often known. My name is William Barnes Graham, the Executive Editor at the Institute, and I will be your host today. And our regular listeners will be well aware that this isn't the first time we've run a webinar on VDOM. However, it is the first session we've done on the UK's plans for its border since the official model was published in late August. As such, this is an opportunity to update you on what's changed since we ran the webinar on the draft of the model in the summer and what the new timeline for changes is going to be. To begin with, though, on the next slide, it is my delight to start introducing our excellent panel of speakers today. And we have three fantastic panelists, each of whom are becoming regulars of late, I'd say. To begin with, it's always a pleasure to welcome Kevin Shakespeare onto the programme. For those who don't know, Kevin is the Institute's Director of Strategic Projects and International Development, and is the mastermind behind several of the Institute's educational programmes, both in the UK and abroad. Anna Doherty is a Senior Trade and Customs Specialist at the Institute, with over 14 years experience in international trade and customs. And finally, Laura Williams is a Trade and Customs Consultant and our lead on sanitary and phytosanitary controls, which will be somewhat useful today, I am sure. However, on the next slide, as it's often my want to do, I'm gonna launch a quick poll to find out a little bit more about you, our audience. So we are here asking, on a scale of one to five, how clear would you say you are on the products which are and are not affected by BTOM? One being completely unclear, five completely clear. While you're answering that poll, as ever, some housekeeping notes from me. Firstly, you can contact me with any comments or questions using the question panel on the control window. And that's usually to the right hand side of your screen. We hope to get to a number of your questions today, though please note we cannot guarantee we will get to every question in the allocated time. As we really do have quite a lot to get through today, there's a lot of information which we're about to share. So as such, I'll be prioritizing questions that have relevance to the wider audience and I won't be going into company or sector specific queries as such. Please note that if your questions are short and clear, I am more likely to be able to read them. So please don't type in one piece, a sentence will usually do. Finally, you will receive a recording of the webinar with a copy of the slides in a follow-up email we will be sending over the next day or so. But I'm gonna share the results. Thank you everyone for responding. So what have we got here? So hopefully you can see the results there. 23% uh, of you said completely unclear, 19% of you also uh, on, on two. So looking at that, it feels as if more people are unclear than clear at this stage. Kevin, if I can bring you on, is that is that a surprise at this stage? Well, first of all, thank you everyone uh, for completing the poll and, and good afternoon. Um, yeah, um, it, certainly there's um, uh, th there's quite a high level on in the uh, the unclear category, so we hope today's webinar will be uh, very very helpful. Uh, and clearly, we will cover aspects not just sanitary and phytosanitary um, uh, plants, animals, and fish uh, based products, but also other products as well. So we really want you to come out of this to be clear what it means for your business and your products. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And as said, thank you everyone for responding to the poll as well. But without further ado, let's go on a bit. Kevin is on the next slide, going to start with a short presentation to set the scene for Anna will later on take the reins uh, for a few, in a few moments time. But now over to you, Kevin. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Will. So uh, if we have the next slide. So what I'm going to do just in the next few slides is, is provide an introduction. And it, this is only background because we really want to get into the uh, the main parts from Anna and Laura. So um, really it's it's um, the, 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 the beat on the border target operating model. It's important to say is a new uh, approach into importing goods into Great Britain, clearly from the European Union, but also the rest of the world. And, and we must we must bear that in mind and we have examples today from the rest of the world and in some cases there's still checks taking place and, and uh, analysis of uh, products from the rest of the world so do that bear that in mind it's not just the european union uh, and it's really this concept of uh, risk categorizations low medium and, and high especially clearly in the uh, uh, the uh, 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 phytosanitary and sanitary space as well 
Um, <clears throat> if we have a next slide, please. So the objective say a new approach post EU exit, the UK borders, uh, and really outlining procedures and systems. Some we've gone through in previous uh, webinars we've had, but there are some some uh, new innovations which we'll, we will refer to today. So uh, changes and new proposed systems around customs declarations, safety and security declarations, which are also very very important for the safety and security uh, of. Uh, of the UK borders, the regulatory checks, the uh, likes of the physical inspections, the identity checks, transit and, and, and groupage is also a key area within the border target operating model. So important to see it in the context, but there's a lot going on in the trade and custom space in the United Kingdom, which certainly can be a challenge to keep up to date, but it can be also an opportunity for businesses operating compliantly and, and really who, uh, who who take the time to to analyze and keep up to date. If we ha have the next slide, please. <clears throat> so some of the key features of, uh, of the border target operating model, clearly the changes in methods and processes of certain border operations. Uh, the re a reference to new customs procedures and IT systems, well clearly that includes CDS, uh, there's also reference to the likes of a single trade window in, in the border target operating model uh, and, and clearly we'll, we'll, we'll be keeping uh, the trade audience up to date of the impacts of the single trade window. But there's also reference to ecosystems of trust which was a, a separate report and, and towards the end I'll come back in and, and make some further references. Also um, uh, uh, reference to trusted trader schemes which we'll go through today. Uh, and these trusted trader schemes, which we may know as authorized economic op operator or more customs based, uh, also really now have a deferent emphasis as well. So if we have the next slide, please. So really this is a slide of reflection. So reflection, if you like, on the interventions and the requirements of moving goods across borders. And we'd stress again, this is not just the United Kingdom. This is moving goods from a, a customs territory a sanitary and phytosanitary territory from one to another. Uh, and, and these requirements apply throughout the world. You have the customs elements, the safety and security, in some cases for our, our, our uh, RORO ports, so GVMS, the Goods uh, Vehicle Movement Service. Uh, and then for the sanitary and phytosanitary, you have the likes of the, the certificates, the health certificate, the catch certificate, the phytosanitary certificate, and the need to uh, import pre-notification. And then finally, if you have, for example, uh, dual-use goods, you might require an export license. So at that stage, and really now to get into the detail of the border target operating model, I'd like to pass to Anna. Thank you. Uh, I know we can't hear you. You might need to just unmute. Apologies. Apologies for that one. You would have thought that by now we would have remembered to unmute ourselves before we speak, but no, still not. Um, so I would like to talk a little bit about what has changed since the draft target operating model was published. Um, and while we would like to think that everything is known, final model has been published, everything is out there, there's still plenty of questions. There's still plenty of clarity that is going to be required. Uh, from the officials. There's still processes that need to be developed and hopefully I will be able to share a little bit of light on what we know and what we are still expecting. And this first slide really is showing you the new timeline of the key changes. And what is important to remember is that while these are the major milestones um, as per the, the VTOM. There will be activities that will be happening in between to enable these milestones to go live. So if you read the border target operating model, and it is 140 pages, it's a lot of reading, there will be loads and loads of different timeline points at which different changes will be happening. But these are really the three clear uh, points at which the majority of the changes will happen. And since the draft was published, uh, as we can see, two of the um, timeline changes, two of the dates have changed and the timeline is looking very much more condensed and majority of changes are expected throughout 2024 now with first starting um, in January. If I can have the next slide please. 
So talking about January and what can we expect in the first milestone on the 31st of January, this is these are the changes which were previously noted as expected on 31st of October. So it would have been this month had they stayed the way they were. And for SPS traders, Germany will see introduction of health certification on medium risk goods and high risk food and feed of non-animal origin from the EU. These certificates will need to be uploaded um, onto IPAPS when a pre-notification is created. So this is a change for those traders which will be dealing with medium goods. And Laura will be able to talk a little bit more about how to identify your product into which category uh, that falls under. Outside of SPS regime, January also brings a big change for British businesses which import goods from the island of Ireland. At the moment, those traders are able to defer full details of their import declarations by up to 175 days, similarly to how declarations from the EU were initially treated uh, at the end of the transition period. Well, this easement will be removed on 31st of January 2024, meaning that full import controls will be applicable to movements from island of Ireland and will need a pre rush declaration or, be, or traders will need to be authorised to use simplified customs declaration processes themselves or make use of them through an agent um, if, they are, uh, if, if there is an opportunity to do that. GVMS will also be required where appropriate um, through the border locations. Next slide, please. So April brings the next stage of SPS regime controls, and we will have documentary and risk-based identity checks introduced on imports of medium risk goods, and with the exception of Ireland of Ireland, which I'll cover on the next slide because Ireland gets a little bit longer timeline here. Importers of SPS goods from rest of the world countries will also see changes happening with bringing those processes in line with those applicable for EU imports. So if you're already importing SPS goods from outside of the European Union, then you will have the opportunity to streamline your processes and for it to be the same for rest of the world countries as well as for uh, imports from the EU. Next slide, please. And finally, on 31st of October, we will see some changes around border processes for all traders importing from the EU with the removal of the waiver for the import safety and security declarations. And I'm going to talk about safety and security declarations a little bit later, so I'm not going to go into detail here. But this is also when we might start using the single trade window and we're expecting the first, re at the moment, the first release is expected around this time initially to enable those import safety and security declarations to be lodged and also for pre-lodged uh, customs declarations. For Ireland, movement from the island of Ireland, documentary identity and physical checks for SBS goods will be introduced no earlier than 31st of October. So it could be later and this is one of the things that we're still awaiting confirmation of but it won't be any earlier than 31st of October 2024. Um, thank you. Next slide, please. So beyond the dates, what else has actually changed from the, the draft model to the final border target operating model? And one of these changes relates to the trusted trader schemes proposed for SPS goods. And Kevin has already touched on the fact that we already have a, a, a many trusted trader schemes. Uh, these offer facilitations to those traders that meet high standard of compliance that can demonstrate that compliance and that can maintain it. Therefore, they will be subject to facilitations that will allow them to, uh, to make the journey of their goods a little bit easier. For SPS goods, these schemes, if implemented, because they still need to be piloted, will be applicable to traders dealing in majority with medium risk goods. So they won't be applicable to high risk goods, they'll still be subject to controls and low goods won't really benefit from it. But if you deal with low goods and medium goods, then you could perhaps consider um, those trusted trader schemes. Two of the schemes from the draft border target operating model have remained. That's the accredited trusted trader scheme and authorized operator status. With the third one, which was called Technology Assurance Scheme or TAS, that was removed as a standalone scheme and instead aspects of it have been incorporated into pilots for the other two, two schemes. Uh, next slide, please. So accredited trusted trader scheme would be applicable 
for frequent importers of medium risk products of animal origin and animal byproducts and could potentially remove the need for physical checks at border control posts. It will be a modular scheme where businesses will be able to choose which module to apply for based on their specific operational needs. However, these modules first need to be piloted though and expression of interest is currently open for businesses that wish to participate. So if you the, if you are dealing with EU goods and with medium risk products, this might be something to consider to take part in a pilot to see whether you can influence how these pilots are shaped, how these schemes are shaped. Um, slide Next slide, please. So there are currently three modules which are being considered for pilots, which offer different facilitations, and they do have different uh, applicability criteria. So businesses would need to have a look at either both expression of interest for these or for the uh, for the current proposed criteria for compliance to see whether any of these would be beneficial to them and what, how they operate. And the, because these are modular, uh, this is a modular approach, it means that if only one of these is suitable for you, great, all you've got to do is comply with one of them. You don't have to worry about the compliance expectation of the other modules because they wouldn't be applicable to you. Uh, next slide, please. However, talking about requirements, there are some core requirements that will be applicable to anybody willing to, wishing to participate, regardless of the modules that they're trying to undertake. And this is being uh, the core requirements, such as being a registered business in the UK for customs purposes and having good compliance history, including around SPS goods. And the other requirements, such as having um, recognized persons, having biosecure premises, provide end-to-end -end supply chain assurance, these will all be dependent on the module that you're wishing to participate in. Now, it's also important to remember that pilots are being run to establish the viability of these pro processes, and therefore the compliance requirements and participation requirements may still be revised before any of these schemes actually go live. Uh, next slide, please. For medium risk plant and plant products, DEFRA is considering launching authorized operator status scheme, but this is currently still at a proposal stage, so businesses cannot yet sign up to pilot. So with, with the ATTS, there's expression of interest, pilots will be happening. For this one, authorized operator status, DEFRA is still considering whether this is a viable solution. And if piloted and launched, having authorized operator status will allow businesses to perform risk-based and identity checks at their designated premises, rather than have the, re uh, the relevant officials perform the checks at the border locations. Uh, next slide, please. However, before any businesses can be considered for authorized operator status, they will need to obtain control point designation for their premises. And what is interesting and important is that while obtaining control point designation is necessary to be considered for AOS, you could obtain such designation even if you do not plan on becoming author on obtaining authorized uh, operator status. If you have your premises authorized as a control point, this would allow for the checks to be performed there at your premises rather than at the border locations. Uh, however, those checks would be performed by the relevant authority. So you would have to be able to have your pres uh, premises adapted in such way to enable officials to perform the controls at your premises rather than a border control point. And applications for control point designation are now open. So if this is of interest to you, um, then this is this is the path that you can take now. And it's really important to remember that um, you will need to be a control point before you can actually be um, authorized for um, authorized um, operators to obtain authorized operator status. Um, next slide, please. So one aspect of movement of SPS goods that is still causing a lot of concern for a lot of uh, a lot of businesses is how groupage will be treated. And groupage means that a single container or a truckload contains multiple consignments from multiple senders. 
And because all the goods cross the border together in a single vehicle or a container, if one of the consignments is called for inspection or a documentary check, the whole load will be diverted uh, to a border control uh, post uh, and held up. And this is co especially concerning when medium goods are being transported, as they will be subject uh, to some checks at the border, as Laura will be explaining a little bit later. Um, next slide, please. So there are several things that are currently being considered to reduce the possible disruptive impacts on groupage loads, because majority of goods, when they are medium or low, uh, or low risk, they will usually move on the groupage. Um, so there is a lot of consideration being given on how to best design processes that will maintain the control element, but facilitate um, facilitate the movements across the border and ensure that where possible those disruptions uh, are minimized. And for groupage consignments of animal products that require export health certificate, there are considerations about introducing two mod models of dealing with this with varying easements, but further information and detail is still expected. So, so far all we know that there is consideration being given and understanding that there are two ways of dealing with groupage, that not all groupage is the same. There are two models being considered and different facilitations within those modules of how to ease those movements. And a consolidated hub model, that is where a distribution center which receives consignments from multiple shippers in a central location before loading onto a single vehicle for dispatch and export. So that's a single point of where goods are consolidated and then they cross the border. However, there's all on the group, there's also a multiple multiple pickup model. And this is where a truck may leave the depot empty and on its journey to the border may be picking up various consignments along the way collecting from different uh, from different vendors and then that single truck will cross the border so there are considerations about how to approach certification for these seals uh, and how to make journeys a little bit uh, smoother for those type of traders for plant and plant products a single certificate can already cover multiple consignments within a single shipment but the impact of inspection of one product on a whole load can still be significant. So further considerations are required when a single consignment is selected for checks. And what does that do for a, a groupage a consignment and any delays to the products contained within those vehicles? Next slide, please. So I mentioned earlier that we're going to talk a little bit about safety and security information. and. For those of you that deal with rest of the world goods, you know, um, and hopefully majority of you, if you're trading internationally, you understand that there is a different type of declarations that happen when goods cross the border. We have customs declaration and they deal with the fiscal elements of control. So your duty, uh, your, your taxes and anything related to the control of the product. And then we have the safety and security declarations and they look more at the parties involved in the journey, at the journey of the, of the, of the mode of transport and looking at the security aspects of that. And uh, UK has Im implemented a full safety and security regime. We have them on the import declarations from rest of the world, we have them on exports. However, since end of the transition period, we have had a waiver in place uh, for, uh, we have had a waiver in place for arrivals from the EU, where the imported goods from the EU did not need to have the import safety and security declarations lodged. Now, some traders, A, they may not even realize that they're having safety and security declarations done on their behalf as part of the package of clearance, or they may be voluntarily completing safety and security declarations for the EU imports. But from the 31st of uh, October 2024, the, the waiver will be removed and those safety and security information will be required and those declarations will be required. However, um, the considerations being given is about splitting the um, safety and security declarations, and this is both for the EU and for the rest of the world, into three categories, making 20 of the fields, sec the security critical fields mandatory for completion, up to eight conditional fields, which will be dependent on either mode of transport, country of arrival or type of goods, and then nine optional fields, which if the trader or the declarant wishes to complete, they can. It's important to remember that while some of these are being made conditional or optional, 
you will, if you're co currently completing safety and security declarations, you will still be able to do them as you are. So there's no really changes to the process. There's just an, uh, an opportunity to reduce the data set. And we mentioned earlier that a single trade window is being implemented towards end of October, that first release. This is where we're expecting the safety and security declarations to be able to be entered through the single trade window. Uh, next slide, please. And this is really just the split of those data fields into the 20 of the compulsory here on the left, conditional and then the optional. Uh, I won't go through them. Uh, as I said, some of them will be mandatory and those 20 compulsory you will have to complete. Then the, the conditional one will be dependent on the scenario and then the optional one are up to you whether you wish to complete them or not and how easy it is for your processes. Uh, next slide, please. So I've mentioned earlier that there is still a lot of things that we actually don't know. And it's quite interesting because there's things we, we, we know we don't know because they're mentioned in the beat. I'm saying further information is still to follow. And then there will be many things that we perhaps don't know we don't know yet because they will only come out in a wash once everything is starting to be um, implemented by traders, by holders, that, that there are still hiccups to come, as I'm sure everybody is, uh, is aware. So, and please know that the list here on the slide, this is not an exhaustive list of everything that is still yet to come. So you can expect probably a little bit more updates from us. And um, there's quite a few that are quite big ones. One of them being the summary of responses after consultation on border control posts costs including how the common user charge will be applied so we still don't really know how much it's going to charge how much it's going to cost to have your goods inspected at the border control post there's still additional details of uh, bcp infrastructure especially around covering the short straight journey so those arriving through from uh, from the eu from mainland eu and from uh, island of ireland um, and a system of booking slot for inspections at BCPs and expected duration of inspections and appointments. So there's still a little bit more to come. And some of you in very particular industries, you may be having very particular questions. You may still have to wait a little bit for those answers, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And I believe the next slide, I come in with a quick poll, just to give you a bit of a breather. So we're here asking you the question, how would you rate your understanding of the risk categories for the products affected by BTOM? And once again, it's a sliding scale of one to five. Uh, just while people are answering that poll, um, Anna, we've had a few good questions in already, but one, uh, we've had a few people ask about uh, things like trials and stuff like that. So a question from Anna says, our business supports pharma companies distribute medical products, lab kits, uh, human animal specimens, et cetera, which are to be used within clinical trials. Will the BTOM affect the way we ship these goods and how? This is a great example of one of those industries that will still be awaiting further details. The BTOM very much focuses on the commercial aspects of selling and buying goods, and that is very much covered. And then you have other areas like samples, like goods for clinical trials, where further consideration is being given and uh, those stakeholders that are involved in these sort of areas they are the ones that will be consulted usually will be consulted uh, to find out the best solutions for them but in worst case scenario the anything that applies to btom will be applicable to those type of goods but i believe further uh, information is expected Thank you. Thank you, uh, Anna, and I hope that's helpful, Amy. I mean, it's, uh, it's a lot of information in BTOM, but it's, 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 not, it's a live thing still. There's a lot of, a lot of information still to come, and as noted, we'll be doing further webinars in the future, I'm sure. Let me close the poll there. Thank you, everyone, for responding as ever. Uh, so, uh, again, a, a fifth of you uh, say you have no understanding at all of the, the different risk categorizations, uh, saying similar amounts, say kind of a not great understanding. Only 5% of you have a comprehensive understanding. Kevin, if I can just bring you in briefly there. Uh, so there's still a bit of work to do, isn't there, in industry to kind of raise awareness of, of how this is all going to work. Uh, excuse me. Yes, um, there, there, uh, there is. And I think um, uh, Laura will be going through some of these in the case of sanitary and phytosanitary. Uh, uh, but still some further announcements with regard to certain rest of world countries as well. So uh, I think it's important 
the likes of the Institute, obviously, we're, when we're presenting it, we try and present it uh, clearly, noting that if uh, if a category is not low risk, if it's medium risk, for example, that the the, the requirements are uh, are uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, more more intense, let's say, uh, and 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 more akin to what you currently experience for rest of the world trade. Thank you, thank you, Kevin, and thank you everyone for responding. It really does help us as we have our dialogue with government about what industry needs. But conscious of time, so it's now my delight to hand over to Laura to go into a bit more detail about the SPS changes, including risk categorizations that are coming in under BCOM. So over to you, Laura. Thank you very much. So we're first going to look at plants, uh, products, or um, what are known as photosanitary products. So next slide, please. So it's important to understand that there is a new regime and it applies controls based on, again, as we've discussed, the low, medium or high risk categories. So there are separate risk categorizations for imports from the EU, Liechtenstein, Switzerland and the rest of the world. So in some cases, there are some still some differences and a lot of that is actually based on the origin of the goods. So we are actually more focused uh, and looking at proportional risk levels. So what that means is when you have your goods inspected or they ask to take bio samples is so they can build up a database. And hopefully the idea of this database is to actually reduce the amount of goods that are in the medium and increase the amount of goods that are in the low risk category in the long term. Next slide, please. So as you can see from this slide, what we've really tried to do is just give you a visual impact here of the difference in the regime or the inspection rate of what we expect versus what is currently in place. So it's really important to notice there that there is a really large reduction in goods, especially within the medium risk categories. So this means that any goods that come in here, you are no longer going to be expected to receive mandatory inspections. Next slide, please. So here we've given you a highlight of some of the high risk categories, some of the more uh, common items that are actually brought in. So it's important to note here the seeds, um, where it states here seeds specific plants. This actually refers to anything along the lines of onions, leeks, rapeseed, peppers, beans, um, seeds of trees such as Douglas fir uh, and pines which also includes Christmas trees. These are all classified as high risk products. We also have things like wood, which may be a high risk product when it's coming from the rest of the world, but is considered a medium risk item when it's coming from the EU. And when it comes to the product of wood, such as bark, a lot of the time that will be a high risk category unless it's coming from the EU. Next slide, please. So a lot of our goods within our plant section, which come under medium risk, where it says parts of plants other than fruits and seeds. We have cut flowers and seeds of prunes, rubus and z maize. So parts of plants is anything like a tomato plant, aquatic plants such as swamp weeds or tape grass. And then we have cut, cut flowers such as your orchids or your carnations. And then with our seeds of prunes, rubus and zemes, that can be anything from cherries and peaches. And then we have our rubus, which is raspberries and blackberries. And then our zemes, which are actually anything corn and maize related. These will all be medium risk categories. And as we said, medium risk will require a photosanitary certificate and pre-notification. So next slide, please. So it's important to know that anything within the low risk category just requires pre-notification. It will not require a photosanitary certificate. So you just need to inform uh, through the IPATH system that you're actually just bringing these low risk goods in. This just allows for random generation of inspection. So generally, as we showed you earlier on our um, table, this would be a very minimal, a maximum of 1% of low risk goods are expected for random inspection. Next slide, please. So 
what we've done here is give you an example of our rest of the world countries. So there are some items that you can import in from the EU, but are actually prohibited or have a different risk category when they're coming from the rest of the world. So it's important to, to understand that this does not include the Liechtenstein or Switzerland, they come under the EU regulations. So grains, there are a lot of countries that we do not allow those goods to come in without photosanitary certificates. So please be aware if you're importing from outside of the uh, EU, in some cases, the risk category will not be reduced. They will still be maintained at medium. Next slide, please. So we're going to take a little bit more of an in-depth look now at the products of animal origin and how that's broken down. So this can be anything that is um, got any form of animal product within it. So next slide, please. So as we've given you a breakdown here, this can be anything from your fresh meat and offal. It can also be live animals and it can also be anything along the lines of honey or products that are made from them. So such as milk or dairy, any dairy products at all. Next slide, please. So when it comes to our dairy products, there are different rules and regulations depending on whether or not it's a raw product or if the product has actually been gone through any processing and is considered non-raw. So it's important to understand that anything dairy, so as it says here, milk, cream, yogurt, and including lactose-free milk, cheese, butter and buttermilk, chocolate and whey protein all come under the dairy product restrictions. Next slide, please. So for our animal-based products, again, we have a high, medium and low risk category. It's important to understand with these that it's actually been published by DEFRA which products fall into which category. So hopefully if you haven't had the opportunity to review that data, please look on the DEFRA website and they actually have a breakdown of the products and their categorizations. It's important to understand that just because a product starts off in the medium risk category doesn't mean that it will always stay there. Depending on current climate and any disease that may be going on or any biodiverse information that's taken, these may move both up and down within the risk category section, depending on, again, the origin of where they're coming from. Next slide, please. So it's really important to understand that there, again, there has been a massive reduction on the inspection rate of both the documentation and the physical inspection when it comes to low risk goods. Um, and when it comes to the medium risk goods, there has been a very large reduction on any physical inspections that will be taking place. So the documentation checks will be done as mandatory when they are associated with your IPAS pre-notification. And again, if you are moving your goods through from Europe, all of this information will be available on your GVMS system to show you whether or not you've been selected for inspection. Next slide, please. So here we've broken down exactly what the requirements are for each of the risk categories for you. So as it says here, within the low risk categories, there is no health certification required. So an export health certificate is not required to accompany that shipment for import into the UK from the EU. Also, it is important to notice that a pre-notification is still required though. You also need to still enter via an appropriately designated border control post. When it comes to our medium risk categories, Again, you still need to do the pre-notification, but in this case, you will have to have an accompanying export health certificate. So there is no need, there is still a need to enter via the designated border control post. And depending on the product, you may be subject to both physical and documentary and checks of your product at this point. Next slide, please. 
So when we're looking specifically at our dairy products, here we've looked within the EU regulations. So milk for human consumption is still classified as a medium risk, so will require an export health certificate and pre-notification. And the same comes for any dairy products and cholesterol-based products for human consumption. Where we move into the low risk category is where it's products other than those mentioned in category two. So as you will notice, there is a distinction again between raw milk and processed milk as to which category it falls into. So non-raw dairy products and colostrum-based products for human consumption, which are preserved at frozen or chilled temperatures, are considered to be a low-risk category group. So as we've given you some details here, please note that when we're providing you with examples, none of these lists are exclusive. So please always check DEFRA's list yourself just to be on the safe side. You can also use the UK Global Tariff to check the details of any requirements for the import. Next slide, please. So here we're looking specifically at our meat and poultry. Now, as you can see here, any products that are shelf stable ambient temperature are automatically classified as low risk. So you just need a pre-notification for these items coming in. But where we get into something where you require an export health certificate and a pre-notification is where we're looking at any meat product, any poultry product, or any game or rabbit meat. Anything that has been rendered animal fat is considered low risk. It's very important to notice, especially within the poultry meat and poultry meat products for human consumption, they are medium risk from the EU and from other sources from the rest of the world but in some cases, they are actually prohibited to be imported from certain countries. So please ensure that you understand the requirement for the origin of your goods when importing from the rest of the world. Next slide, please. So it's important to note here that exempt goods are not permitted to contain any meat products at all. So if your products meet the exemption rule for products of animal origin, as we've noted here within the low category, they are not by law allowed to contain any meat in any fashion at all. When it comes to our infant formula, it's medium regardless of the product type. So due to this, we have medium risk and therefore does require an export health certificate and pre-notification. Next slide, please. So within the animal products, we also have our fish categories where we have our catch certificates. So while we do still have a health certificate, it is under a different format. So it's important to notice that there is a big difference between our fishery products from our uh, aquaculture and uh, mollusks, and also within our fishery products when it comes to wild caught fish. Wild caught fish is actually a low category if it meets certain criteria. And some of those criteria are things along the lines of mercury levels. It's also important to note that there are histamine levels within fish as well. And this can have a dramatic increase on the risk level that it meets. So any fish on the histamine level association is deemed medium risk. So anything along the lines of tuna, mackerel, anchovies or herring are all considered to be medium risk, no matter where they are caught. Whitefish can be considered low, but only if it meets certain standards when it comes to the testing. So in these cases, it's very important to understand the source of the fish and what levels in order to be able to understand if you meet the medium or the exemption low list. Thank you very much. Next slide, please. So here we have our rest of the world examples. So we have a breakdown here to show you how in some countries, as we've mentioned earlier, there is a different in risk categorization purely because of the origin based of those goods. 
so non-raw dairy products and colostrum-based products, when coming from Canada and New Zealand, are considered low risk. And that is because of the schemes that they have in-house and they meet certain standards within our food safety origins as well. But other rest of the world countries are automatically given a medium risk category. When it comes to ed products for human consumption, other than frozen or chilled, the USA is considered to be a low risk, as where anywhere else, the other rest of the world countries are automatically given a medium risk category. So again, it's very important to understand not just the standard requirements for your products, but also the origin, as this may amend any additional measurements that you have to go through. So again, we've given you some examples here, but please check on the DEFRA website or the UK Global Tariff if you're unsure of any requirements that you might have when importing or exporting your goods through the new border target operating model. Next slide, please. So it's important to understand when it comes to organics. This is one of those areas that Anna uh, alluded to earlier where we don't, we know what we don't know. So under the new uh, border target operating model that has been finalized, all we have been told is that under the grace period, which at the moment no certificate of inspection is required, there, the easement will come to an end on the 31st of December, 2023. At the moment, we are still awaiting further information from the government as to whether or not the, there will be a subsequent implementation of uh, any new facilities or any new infrastructure on organic products after the 31st December, or if there may be an extension to the easement period. So as soon as we actually receive that information, we will of course distribute that to you as our members. So thank you very much. Uh, next slide, I would like to hand over to, back to Kevin Shakespeare, please, to discuss how traders should prepare. Thank you very much indeed, Laura. Uh, so very conscious uh, there was there's a lot to take in and, and that's really the nature of, of the border target operating model. Um, <clears throat> so a, a, a very keen that the, the impact on yourself will depend on the type of business and the, and the products you have. Um, so um, we always say traders should prepare and, and this is no different and we sort of uh, try to get that message of, of, of preparation including obviously speaking with your EU, uh, EU, your EU suppliers, your rest of the world suppliers especially around the EU, uh, around the official vet checks where they apply. Uh, check the origin of your goods, I think, as Laura's just mentioned, but also it, it, the, the true origin uh, points around suppliers' declarations can also be important uh, uh, when looking at origin. Um, so we have <coughs> have the next slide, please. <coughs> so um, clearly, as I've said, that this is not just standalone. It's not just a beat on on its own. There's a lot going on at the moment. And it's important, I think, to see trade as always, trade and customs in, in its entirety and not just one section. So uh, we at the Institute of Export will, will keep everyone updated. Uh, and, and we have a, a, a strong rollout of training, which is very much linked to events as they happen, whether it's uh, CDS, whether it's the changes around border checks, for example, safety and security declarations, the requirements and BTOM and say say on sanitary phytosanitary and also the changes announced in the spring budget as well as transit and groupage as well. Um, I think a final thing I, I, I sort of wanted to sort of pick up here is the announcements of the trusted trader scheme. So the ecosystem of trust, which is the name is going to change to border trade demonstrators, BTD, um and the accredited trusted trader scheme if there is an interest in finding out more and trying to apply please let us know we're already working with several of our members in making applications for the uh, and supporting them in the in, in the uh, in the accredited trusted trader scheme and also trying to to build on the ecosystem of trust pilots for our members as well so please don't hesitate to contact us we will try and support you uh, because these these new trusted trader schemes have the opportunity to facilitate trade and we're very happy to try and work with you as much as possible. Now we note obviously that the accredited trusted trader scheme closes on the 6th of October. As I said, we're working with several of our members to, uh, to, to submit applications. 
but we're happy to try and support your applications as well and try and support use of facilitations under these schemes, possibly going beyond what has been quoted in the border target operating model. So please don't hesitate to contact us. We, we're happy to sort of try and consider to be a hub receiving information and supporting as far as is possible. So um, uh, at that, I'll pass back to, uh, to Will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you, Laura, for the presentation as well. Um, so we're going to get to a few of your questions now. But as we do that, I'm going to launch a couple of quick fire polls, uh, basically asking if you agree with a couple of the following statements. And we'll get into the Q&A as you're answering these polls. So let's get going. We've had lots of good questions. Thank you, everyone. First question in from uh, Marie. He was asking about uh, whether we could provide links to the new EU health certificates required from 31st January. Uh, she's talking about products of animal origin and fishery in particular. Um, any tips from the panel in terms of where Mary can go to get those uh, the EU health certificates? Does it vary per country? Am I right in saying that? Uh, Laura, do you want to take that one? Yes, um, so it depends on which country you're applying through and also if as an applicant you are part of a special or authorised regime. Um, each country has a list of their own authorised plant inspectors or their equivalent of and also a list of their own authorised um, certified veterinarians that can issue the export health certificates. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, and another question, I was just picking up on part of your presentation. So Amy was saying uh, low risk plants, plant products, do they not require pre notifications to IPAPs after 31st January as per the Tom uh, or has this changed? Um, no, she's absolutely right. It hasn't changed, but I will clarify uh, my point I was making earlier. So there are still some species within the low risk categories that currently are still going to require a pre-notification. And that is more to actually allow AFRA to take bio samples to be able to measure these products and build up their biodiverse database, which again, in the long run, will allow them to reduce the risks uh, from medium to low risk, hopefully in the long run of a lot of our plant on plant products. Terrific, thanks Laura. I'm just gonna close the that poll and launched the fourth one. I'll share the results at the end. So this one's asking you whether you agree with the statement that BTOM is going to benefit your business and boost your ability to trade internationally. Right, uh, another question which came through from Simon saying, will the border target operating model change requirements for licenses and authorizations for prohibited goods? Uh, Anna, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure, of course. So there are certain changes happening, obviously, to SPS goods, and that affects the, the controls around it, including certification. However, there's currently no provisions in the border target operating model affecting any other type of controlled goods uh, that would be subject to licensing, uh, such as uh, such as CITES or even uh, dual use goods or anything like that. So, so no, there is no other licensing changes other than the changes at the moment happening to the SPS regime goods. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And a question in from Martin who asked, how much would it cost to become authorised and how much will uh, they charge to come to your site to check the goods? Uh, Anna? Uh, so you want me to take that one or? Yeah, uh, sorry, apologies. I wasn't listening properly to the question. Not a problem. No. So uh, basically, at the moment, because it's still within the pilot scheme, until it's signed off, no fee list or um, uh, has been set or determined as yet. So once it's actually finalised, we will receive a availability to obtain that information. Now, bear in mind, it will be a case of uh, each facility is allowed to set their own uh fees so at the moment we can't actually tell you this is another one of those areas that anna was explaining earlier that unfortunately we just don't have that information coming from the government as yet because they haven't finalized it themselves thank you thank you laura um uh, no worries anna as well as a lot of information to present as well as to take in so i'm um, completely understood uh so i'm just going to close that poll uh, and we'll do a couple more questions before i share the results of those 
So probably another one for Laura, this one came from Jamie. Uh, Jamie, currently we do not need phytosanitary certificates or veterinary health certificates for seeds, cereals or bird feeding purposes. Are these going to be required going forwards or where can I find out? Right, so it will entirely depend on how those are processed. So certain processing of seeds for animal feed go through a significant heat treatment, which means that they reduce or eliminate any pests or biomaterials that would cause them to require a photosanitary certificate. So it, if they are raw, then they will require, but if they have been processed significantly, uh, as I say, through either heat treatment or sterilization, then they won't. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, question maybe for Anna, this one uh, from Milena, who asks, how will the SBS checks work with the simplified declaration procedure? At which point will IPATH's pre-notifications be required? Is that the time of the goods entry or the point of the supplementary declaration? So pre-notification, as the name suggests, is a notification ahead of the goods arrival. So this enables controls at the border. And with SCDP, your customs declarations is split into two processes. You have an element that happens ahead of the goods arrival, and then you have a little bit longer to provide the additional information in terms of, uh, as a supplementary declaration. Pre-notifications in the majority of cases have to be uh, have to be pre uh, have to be created uh, one working day ahead of the goods arrival. Now there are some simplifications for some products which allows up to four hours, but in any case it has to be before the goods arrive. It is not at the second stage of SCDP with the, with the supplementary declaration. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. We'll do a couple more questions. We're going through these quite quickly. So uh, well done, panel, in that respect. Uh, Isabel asks, uh, organic goods from the European Economic Area or EU, will these need a certificate of inspection from the 1st of January 24? Laura, do you want to take that one? Yeah, the simple answer, I'm afraid, is we don't know yet. Um, at the moment, we know that the current scheme of easement is still officially published to end on the 31st of December. But at the moment, we don't have any information as to what the implications of that are going to be. We are expecting either to have some clarification or there may even possibly be an extension, but that's just my gut feeling. I've certainly not heard any rumours, so I want to dis dispel that idea right there and now. Um, it's just my experiences. I would have expected some further information by now. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. It's, it's a lot of information to come, to, it seems, but obviously we'll be doing more webinars uh, as that information comes through, we hope. And also Laura is doing a uh, member-only webinar for, for Institute members uh, called the Lunchtime Learning. That's on Thursday this week, tomorrow. That's also an SBS right. check, so we'll go into even more detail about uh, SBS tomorrow. All very exciting stuff. Let me just quickly share the results to the two polls. So the, it's a bit more positive than earlier in the session. So 61% of you agree and 12% of you strongly agree that you're familiar with the major milestones and deadlines that will affect your business because of BTOM. Um, still 27% of you aren't as sure, but that's, that's slightly more positive than the questions asking for clarity about what BTOM was earlier. The fourth poll, if I just quickly fiddle with the settings, so interestingly, um, just about a majority, 51% of you either agree or strongly agree that BTOM is going to benefit your business and boost your ability to trade internationally. Uh, and what was it, for 49% of you disagree. So we'll really split down the middle there. Uh, Anna, is that, is that, that seems broadly quite positive, I suppose. What, what do you make about poll response? Well, Especially poll number four and how will it help my business trade internationally? I think it will really depend on which area you trade in and how much of the changes actually affect you. If you are a trader dealing in SPS goods, if you've been exporting those goods to the EU, the EU has implemented SPS regime checks uh, right from the end of the transition period. So our the goods exported from the UK have been subject to these checks, the controls, documentation already. Uh, so to bring those checks in the UK, it levels, it evens out the, the playing field for those businesses. So if you're both importing and exporting, this means that that there is a that there is an element of um, of 
that it, that it levels it out. At the other side, BTOM is also bringing in certain simplifications. So if you're at the moment dealing with the uh, rest of the world SPS gods, then some of the modernization of the of this regime will allow you to the, to alternate your processes and to match them to the e, to the process being developed for the EU trade. And so perhaps that's where some benefits may be coming in as well. At the same time, obviously, BTOM being very much about an SPS regime, if you're not an SPS trader, there are things that are going to affect you, especially if you're importing from Ireland or if you're importing from the EU and you're not currently doing safety and security declarations, there are big impacts there. But at the same time, if you're not SPS, SPS is the big one that is having to adapt the most to whatever changes the BTOM is bringing. Thank you. Thank you. And that's a really point, important point about the party of exports. If the export was something would have been brought in, and like this is two, three years on from Brexit, I suppose these border controls would come in at some point. Uh, I guess what businesses probably want most now is just a, a bit of certainty and clear timelines which, which stick uh, to plan towards, I suspect. But Definitely. we have run out of time, I'm afraid. So at this point, a big thank you to our panel today, Kevin, Anna and Laura. There's, that was a heck of a lot of information to, to put across there. And I hope everyone has uh, started to see the wood through the trees just a little bit. A reminder, we will be sending the recording of today's webinar with a copy of the slides in the follow-up email, which you should get in the next day or so. Please get in touch if for any reason this email doesn't come through to your main inbox. We are currently running a campaign to support businesses to understand and prepare for the various changes that are due to come in over the next 18 months for how the UK trades with the EU and rest of the world. Whether that's BTOM, Transit, the Windsor Framework, CDS or EU custom rules. On the webpage for the uh, BTOM and Beyond campaign, which is shown on the screen, you can find a white paper about the changes that are ahead, questionnaires to help you identify which of these changes affect your business, and links to where you can get further support and training to help you to prepare for them. So if you search for BTOM and Beyond on export.org.uk, that's how you can find a wealth of support relating to future UK trade, trade changes. Our next webinar is going to be on, the, on another upcoming update to how the UK trades, this time regarding transit and the introduction of NCTS 5 next month. That's going to be on the 25th of October and will feature a guest speaker from HMRC alongside our very own Madeline Gibson. You can go to export.org.uk for more information about our upcoming webinars and activities, including how to join as a member of the Institute and the educational and consultancy services we provide to businesses and individuals looking to thrive in international trade. As you leave, please let us know what you thought of today's webinar and any suggestions for topics in future events by completing the short exit survey. But for now, thank you for joining us today. Hope you have a great rest of the day and goodbye.